are all united. Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our session Education 4.0, who is looking at cybersecurity. Well, at this session, we will tackle the issue of cybersecurity given the context of the pandemic and the transition from traditional education to online education. It addresses the challenges for privacy and safety for children and youth who are the most impacted by online educational platforms and the roles of each stakeholder in improving the trust of digital educational spaces for the purpose of expanding teaching and learning to the internet. So we, we will tackle the policy question of good privacy in uh, cybersecurity practices and international mechanisms that could be useful to increase trust in, in online education. So at the end, we will be addressing the actions and measures taken by the different stakeholders, including the government, civil society, technical community, and private sector to address this uh, issue uh, by creating a safer environment for the education. Uh, we need to consider the fact that uh, underage groups are especially exposed and vulnerable in this context. So today I have some special guests with me. I will proceed to read uh, a brief biography of each of them. Joao Moreno Rodriguez Falcao, he is a cybersecurity specialist at IntelliWay, uh, focused in IoT security and, and all cybersecurity schemes. Uh, we have online uh, Eric Badcher, that is the Security Operations Center Specialist, and a penetration tester at the CCV Bank Limited in Ghana. At my right uh, is Samaila, he's a cybersecurity expert holding a master's degree in cybersecurity, and uh, a manager from the University of Warwick, and He's uh, also the director on, of the Cybersecurity Experts Association of Nigeria. In my left, we have Savio Moraes, that is a professor and system administrator from the Federal Institute of Rio Grande do Norte. And I don't know if our last speaker is online. That is Nidi. Nidi is a senior project officer from the Center for Communication Governance at the National Law University in Delhi and vocal board of directors of the Youth Seed. So now I will start by asking some guiding questions to our panelists. So what do you think are the new forms of threats that arise with the transition from traditional education to online education? And what are their impacts for students? What has been done so far by the different stakeholders to tackle these issues? Have these efforts been efficient? So I will take the floor to Shoao. So Shoao, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicolas, for the question. Uh, to me, the most important issue when discussing about connecting children to educational systems, for example, in the pandemic, uh, is that they were using these systems mo almost unattended. So uh, I have an 11-year-old sister that lives with me. In the beginning of the pandemic, we had to rush away uh, to her to connect or uh, to continue studying. Even though I am a cybersecurity specialist, I hadn't done a proper configuration in the system. And yeah, it did not work in our case. So it's, it, it is important to remember that most of all parents weren't uh, right besides their children during the day because they were working. So children had to, or so kids had to figure out how to connect and communicate online without any assistance during the day. So they were immediately exposed uh, to all sorts of uh, issues uh, because they there they could be digital harassed by other children or adults in a lot of cases the children had full control of their devices even though they cannot consent in most applications they access so yeah i paid a closer attention to the efforts made by schools and college to adapt themselves 
In Brazil, we have seen a tendency of concentrating all educational resources in few companies like Microsoft, Google, Meta. And in a cybersecurity perspective only, uh, I think this movement made children information safer. And why? Why that? Because these companies put a lot of resources to protect their assets, therefore these children data. But when some schools decided to use these systems, but a lot of schools actually used, uh, decided to use systems that were not designed for online education, like WhatsApp or Facebook. And these schools actually exposed children to online spaces almost non-controlled. So I think the biggest issue we have now is about the information that we are not able to control from these children because when they are using uh, educational systems, the platforms are designed to keep this information safe and when some schools to connect more people, they try to amplify the ways of uh, sending this content to the children. And this made uh, these children uh, exposed to systems that were not designed to them. So uh, I think, uh, I see the different stakeholders in a diverse, uh, taking uh, various approaches like the cybersecurity community tries to check if these systems are safe and correct issues. I see also a lot of companies that acknowledge that people uh, were using their systems to, to connect to learn and try to fix problems like Zoom that was thought to be a, a meeting platform and out of sudden it, was, it started to be used in a lot of schools, a lot of uh, workplaces and they weren't uh, ready to, to do, to handle this much of responsibility. So. Uh, even though they're great platforms, uh, we had a lot of cases of Zoom bombing and uh, digital harassment. So, yes, I think uh, we we need to get together to to really uh, show that to schools and to the parents what are that what are the advantages and disadvantages of using certain technologies thank you Shao. you touched on some important points there about the platform about the devices about the education for the educators to to use this so now i am heading to eric that is online so eric the floor is yours you have seven minutes thank you thank you so much um, so uh, I will look at this from the uh, attacker's pers uh, perspective, since uh, like the malicious threat actors' perspective, those those people popularly known as the hackers, since that's my field, I'm an ethical hacker and a pen tester. I look at it from that perspective. So uh, first of all, the first threat I like to talk about from uh, transitioning from the um, traditional educational uh, infrastructure to the online is, is, is pertaining to phishing attacks. So when I say phishing attacks, I'm talking about um, uh, cyber crime actors using uh, um, schools, using institutions, network infrastructure as staging grounds to target victims um, and, 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 and industries. So um, and the reason I'm saying this is uh, in my line of work, I've, I've, I've come across or I've encountered a lot of phishing messages after um, analysis and everything. You will find out that it is emanating from um, a school's in, uh, uh, domain, or there's a subdomain attached to, the, to a school's domain where the phishing attack is coming from. But when you go deeper, you will see that no, it is not coming from the school, but a threat actor has compromised the school's network, and they are using that as their playground or as their staging ground to send these phishing messages. 
or this fishing to, 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 to attack other, other institutions. So um, and that's the first threat I'll talk about. Another threat being that threat actors um, um, attempt because now, and, and the, the issue is uh, at, before moving to online, the traditional educational system, yes, we had IT uh, support. We had uh, institutions having their own IT department. We had institutions um, and having their own network, which is intranet uh, and, 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 and in their own in their own local environment. But now transitioning into online, um, these institutions did not we uh, because of I don't know if maybe because of time or how uh, prompt that the, the issue came, they did not have that much time to look at the security posture of their infrastructure before moving the LAN or their in intranet onto the internet. So they migrated most of their vulnerabilities that were locally onto the internet. And then it make also threat actors now start uh, exploiting them as easily as, as possible. And another thing, another threat is, is, is um, um, schools, uh, intellectual properties, universities having research centers and malicious actors just, just, just um, exploiting their systems to gain access to sensitive intellectual uh, uh, properties because of um, 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 these vulnerable apps that were just migrated onto the internet. Because yes, students need to access the material from the internet, so we need to move these things on, on, the, on the internet. And, and some of these attacks, when you look at some of these attacks, they are not any sophisticated attack, but they are common, something like common Google docking. Just common Google docking query, and then you will be able to access the uh, school's um, 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 database, have access to their infrastructure, um, um, common showdown, and just go on showdown, put um, 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 just a common query. And you have vulnerable um, 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 infrastructures and vulnerable systems on the internet. And so, so this, this, these are some of the trends that, that, that also came with, with moving from the tradition to online. Another, another thing is, another threat that I'll talk about are um, 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 activists and, 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 and um, uh, um, let me say, newbies, people who are um, 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 just, just need to hack in because they are able to get access to a school's um, website which is vulnerable. They start defacing the website. They start using it as, 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 as a method to protest, to, 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 to call for attention for a certain cause and all that. And then also the last threat I'll talk about is what um, um, our first um, um, panelist spoke about: zoom bombing. And, and this is this is no no I, I, I say it is no fault of schools though because um, when 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 this happened or when when we moved straight from uh, tradition to online, uh, uh, yes, a lot of people were moving Russian to get students to be online to learn. Zoom also had their own issues because they did not, um, at first, they did not take security into, into, into play. Uh, they, were not, they were not paying attention to security. And even, not only schools, but even higher places were even making mistakes with, with, with sharing their Zoom credentials. They share Zoom, Zoom, Zoom link and it's having the username, it's having the Zoom ID and the passcode all attached to it, showing screenshots. And, these are what other attackers also uh, relied on and then started um, 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 bombing um, 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 Zoom calls with, 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 with nudity and, 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 and what have you. So these are some of the threats that, 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 that emanated from, from, from tradition to online. Now, the thing that has been done so far, I think a lot has gone into, and that one I'll give kudos to Zoom, their platform, a lot, a lot of changes have been have been made into their platform from 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 the time it started. Uh, we we moved on online up to now. They have added a lot of security uh, uh, features, a lot of a lot of restrictions and all that. Also, uh, another thing that has been done and that, that has been also done quite very well is awareness creation, creating awareness all over. Even Zoom itself creating awareness, schools creating awareness, um, uh, uh, other platforms, Microsoft, um, 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 Facebook, uh, other social media platforms where students gather. They have created a lot of uh, uh, awareness, uh, uh, awareness on, on these attacks, 
on these cyber attacks, and and then and then also schools have also been 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 been, been um, um, awareness has been created for a lot of institutions to know how to even move their gadgets from 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 the traditional place onto online, how to safeguard, how to even enforce non security into their 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 environment. And I think these are some of the things that that, that has also been done. And, and looking at organizations and, and building now more secure apps because um, a lot of people uh, are attacking uh, the apps. So organizations are also building a lot of now more secure apps because of what awareness creation. So this is this is what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Very interesting points about the Zoom bombing, about uh, the awareness that is very important to prevent this kind of attacks. You mentioned phishing. You mentioned lot of things. So now we are heading to Samaila here. So Samaila, please, you have seven minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nicolas. Um, I'm just going to speak from the, do I say, the Nigerian perspective. Um, and I'll start with, uh, with the phrase digital literacy. So the first issue that going online has caused, it has exposed the truth about um, the situation of things in the sense that a lot of people have um, little to zero knowledge on digital security. And so when you put those people into the, the cyberspace and you ask them to interact there in the educational sector, you are basically creating easy targets for the attackers. And so because a lot of people have um, little to no security knowledge, they were not able to do the basics that would ordinarily secure them when they're online. And when discussing this issue, I do not want to talk more on the kids, because like, I, I think that has been spoken about a lot already. But when you look at the, the, the teachers as well, the parents, a lot of teachers and parents don't have security knowledge. Um, I've seen cases, I've seen schools where the, the teachers don't even have computers to use um, for their lessons. They do not use PowerPoint slides. So how do you expect those teachers to go on, on Zoom or go on um, <laughs> Google Meet and do things the right way or to use emails and use emails securely? And so that's, um, that's an underlying issue that has led to this um, lack of security when we talk about online learning or online education. And um, so some of the threats that have come out um, uh, obviously, yes, phishing has, has been mentioned. I would just like to focus on two other ones. Uh, malware, in particular, um, uh, what we call ransomware, that's a, that's a malware that locks your computer or encrypts your files until you pay a ransom. We've seen uh, quite a number of universities and schools being, being targeted this way. Um, so they, they have to pay money to gain access to the infrastructure. Another um, issue I've noticed is the case of email hijacking. Um, a, a, a couple of schools have their, uh, um, their emails, the, like the official email accounts being hijacked and being used to send emails um, as maybe the vice chancellor or a lecturer or someone. And um, as we know, those, that, that poses a, a, a big risk in the grand scheme of things. So those are some of the issues I've noticed. Um, there are other ones, if you look at the angle of the child, you talk about um, grooming online grooming because they're now um, more active online and, and many of them end up joining social media. There's um, the, the cases of financial fraud on social media. There's also child sexual exploitation and other um, kinds of, um, of um, issues like that. Um, so on the angle of, of stakeholders and what they've done, from the Nigeria perspective again, um, I think there's been improved um, effort on both the, uh, the part of the government or the public sector and the private sector as well. Um, on the part of the private sector or the NGOs, my organization, that's the Cyber Security Experts Association of Nigeria, uh, has been creating awareness even before the, the pandemic began. That's one of our key pillars, and we try to build cyber security awareness. And we go to schools, we go to universities, we talk to the students, we talk to the teachers to enlighten them on the, on the, on the threats. And there are other NGOs. Um, another important one to mention is Cyber Safe Foundation in Nigeria as well. They've also done a lot of projects around educating young children and, um, and, uh, and adults as well on, on the cyber threats that exist. From the angle of the government, recently the Nigerian government um, released a, a reviewed national cyber security policy and strategy. And, and this document has um, um, inputs that is meant to improve the security of different sectors, including the education sector. And so that's um, a plus on the side of the government. And so 
moving forward, we hope the, the document is implemented properly so that we can yield and enjoy the benefits. Um, so there are several other inputs um, from other places, but I'll leave uh, the, other, the other panelists to contribute. Thank you. Thank you, Samaila. You touched also on a very interesting point, like the, this multidimensional factor that not only the students, but the teachers, uh, different Google Meet, uh, about the malware, ransomware, these uh, email hijackings, right? Uh, the online grooming, the, some cases of fraud, and, and the awareness, awareness, where we are uh, hearing awareness a lot, so that maybe is the way. Uh, now I am heading to Nidhi, uh, so Nidhi, the floor is yours, you have seven minutes. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, I think uh, my colleagues have touched upon a lot of uh, the current sort of problems that we have. Uh, the one that I think I would like to talk about is probably the violation of privacy that you have right now online, especially uh, for children. So I think there's a Casper P report from last year which talks about how there's been a, a marked increase in threats which were disguised as popular e-learning platforms, which just increased as the pandemic went on, especially in the second half of 2020. So there have been a number of technologies that have been deployed to conduct online classes and assessments and attendance. And the more people rely on this, the greater that the level of threat is, especially to people's privacy. So these technologies usually collect a lot of data. Um, they collect things like your name, email address, phone number, login credentials. They have communications like audio, video, text. Uh, one of the things is, depending on the platform you use, but however, most platforms are co covered in this. If you look at, say, the privacy policies of things like WebEx or Google or Microsoft, all of them say that they can collect data while you're in a video conference, combine it with information from data brokers and other sources, and build consumer profiles, and that they can potentially tap into the videos for purposes like training facial recognition systems. So this is clearly one of the bigger, I think, privacy concerns uh, that affects children is that even if you're using one of these safer platforms, there's obviously always the potential for children's data to be misused. Um, more importantly, even though you do have data protection laws in place, um, you have the United Nations Child Rights Convention in place, which says that children's privacy is to be protected. I, not, most of these laws were not quite built to withstand the pandemic, and they haven't really been updated in a way where the data protection can effectively function at this scale right now. Um, so there have been a lot of reports where once everything has moved online, schools or private actors can use platforms. Uh, like there was a report coming out of a Minneapolis a school district where people used a platform called Gaggle, where they scanned... Um, billions of student emails, chat messages, and files uh, to see what the students were talking about, to flag any potential concerns that they had. Uh, so I think the privacy of the students or the privacy of children is affected a lot uh, because of this move to sort of online learning. And that is one of the bigger concerns that we have to sort of address right now. I do think that different stakeholders have tried to address this to some extent. As a lot of my colleagues have pointed out, many people are trying to impart some sort of digital literacy uh, to explain to people that you have concerns surrounding malware, you have concerns surrounding um, hacking or Zoom bombing, but also generally to explain to people how giving out your data online works and how that can potentially be dangerous. Uh, there are also laws in place uh, which are specifically geared towards children. So for that matter, if you look at things like, say, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Law, or COPPA, um, that is a law which specifically is geared towards uh, children and online safety. The problem there, of course, being that COPPA only applies to children 13 and under. So it doesn't quite uh, capture all the kids who'd be affected by, I think, uh, these online interventions. Um, and then I think another thing that we have to discuss, uh, and I only bring this up because my colleagues have also talked about this, is that uh, while you do have edtech platforms, there has been a lack of resources and not everybody can really afford the secure wow. platforms. And so there have been a lot of instances of, say, online classes not being conducted on, like, say, a proper platform, but rather being conducted on Facebook or WhatsApp, uh, purely because of the lack of options that you have. Uh, and sometimes this can make things a little bit less secure. 
so I think that this is also something that probably policymakers have to sort of consider uh, while they're dealing with these issues is that uh, the laws that are geared towards this cannot just specify that, oh, you must use a secure platform because not everybody would have the infrastructure to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. Very interesting points you, you touched on about the these violations of privacy. There were a lot of reports in, in the pandemic uh, about incidents in, at schools. So uh, you also mentioned about the digital literacy. That is something, again, the, the awareness and uh, about all, all the things. And this, this topic of the lack of resources, that, that is very, uh, I agree with you, because no, not every school is prepared to, to afford cybersecurity teams or groups prepared to, to affront the, these incidents. And, and also, I think uh, there was like a, a cultural bring your own device uh, thing at some schools that also is, is very complicated to, to, like, to manage, yes, uh, for, for all the teachers, also all, all the IT team at school. So uh, now uh, our last speaker for this first time, uh, first part, sorry, is Savio. So Savio, the floor is yours. You have seven uh, or eight minutes. Oh, so I got one more minute. Thank you. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> uh, first, first note here is that uh, uh, I work as sys administrator, sys admin, uh, at the Federal Institute of uh, Education, Science and Technology, and Technology of the Rio Grande, Rio Grande do Norte State in Brazil. Uh, we have uh, classes, uh, courses since uh, the departing from the, the high school and technical courses to uh, postgraduate and doctoral. Uh, so we have a wide wide range of students. But uh, I'm not only talking about my institution, but uh, other institutions that I, we, uh, as a federal network of uh, uh, educational institutes, uh, including universities and other uh, uh, institutes from other states, uh, I could get some exp experience and discussions from other universities, so from other institutions. So uh, there are some things that we should point out here. Uh, thinking in the short term, like today or tomorrow or the last year, uh, we had to make a strong migration of how do you deal with the technical services, with, with the, the, the not only the technical services, the administrative services, and also how the classes will go. So uh, as Jos uh, mentioned, uh, most uh, schools migrated to uh, Google, Google Scholar, uh, Google Meet for classes, Zoom for classes, and so on. Uh, and we have to do this migration fast. Uh, considering those uh, examples, uh, we know that we have some privacy issues uh, that must be uh, under discussion for the next years. As uh, this is not like a a, a thing for that when the pandemic uh, get get over, th this will be finished. So it will be different from now, but we still have to debate about that. Uh, and some of the institutions decided for deploy the all systems, like they uh, already have some administrative systems uh, for bureaucracy and so on. But for example, for for uh, having the classes, they deployed, for example, uh, the big blue button for for uh, video calls. Uh, uh, so. Uh, and most part of the teams are not uh, they they do not have deep deep expertise with this new platform. So this, in principle, brings many many issues. Some other ones like uh, contracted uh, this these services and uh, hosted in in the the internal network. Uh, looking for the privacy of the students uh, and the uh, whole institution. So this is a first part. And now we, uh, I'm looking for a, a medium term uh, plans, like uh, not only this uh, part of deployment and looking for 
good uh, open source platforms and make capacity building for the team who is managing this, this type of service or uh, contracting third part services for, for this. Uh, okay, I, I got a bit lost with the time, but I, I, I'll keep going. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, you have the two or three more minutes. Ah, okay. So, yeah. Uh, Contracting third-party services and so on, and and keeping the services updated, and one really important thing that we are starting to do now uh, in the federal network in Brazil uh, of educational institutes uh, is working in uh, having, in fact, the uh, cybersecurity policies, not only the the the, the sector in the IT. Uh, or the, 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 the computer em emergence, the necessary teams, but having the policy in paper, uh, in a document for, for the students, for everyone, and so on. So I think that the next step that we need to move on uh, to assure a secured, uh, a secured uh, education for dot zero uh, is working in a policy, cybersecurity policy for every institute. Very interesting, Savio, from your point of view of a sysadmin, uh, you raise new things like the more attention to, to the logistics, like the, how to configure these platforms in, in this migration. So they, they need some expertise to, to do that. It's not like an easy task. So deploying your own systems could be a solution, I, I see and contracting some parties uh, always uh, could be something, and, and this issue of the policy for students, or have something written about the uh, uh, mechanisms or, or, or control, or, or at least what is good to do, what is bad to do, so they could know. Well, now we are moving to uh, a second part of this uh, workshop. Uh, we, I will raise uh, a question, and, and we, we will have another round uh, with the speakers. So the question is, what are the remaining challenges for guaranteeing cybersecurity and privacy in the online education ecosystem? And how can youth, the youth, be more involved in policy making regarding cybersecurity in their educational environment? So, Joao, the floor is yours. You have five minutes for this part. Okay, thank you, uh, Nicolas. I, I think at the first part of the pandemic, all, all workplaces, all schools were like, take whatever you need, but please give me a working system. So, so we, we pass through this and now we are looking like, wait, what have you done? What information we, we delivered to these companies? What are the issues and the risks we are exposing our students. And yeah, uh, schools, colleges should be a safe place to learn. People there should uh, believe and be, and, and be safe. They need to feel safe to understand things, to express themselves. So the first step we should do is to create the safe environment, to guarantee that everybody will feel welcome there. Uh, we saw a lot of suffering uh, in these month, these past months, and people should uh, have the confidence that this information, the, uh, the flaws that people show when they are learning will be kept there. They will have this environment to express themselves. And in this cybersecurity uh, aspect, I think the uh, bring your own device policy is like a must because we are teaching uh, children and yeah, this students in general, how to use technology too. So technology is integrated into our lives. We use it to learn, we use it to communicate, we use it to almost everything. So they need to use this learning place to know how 
to connect with these systems. So it's important that they know how to uh, to use their own cell phones and how to uh, use their private settings and what are the consequences of installing, I don't know, a, a, any app they want. We, we need to have some control of it. I believe, actually, when talking about children, that these could not be unattended as it is now. Maybe the schools should have some control of the students' devices when they are in the uh, educational spaces because they're, these children are responsibility of them in that place. And um, yeah, uh, I think that's it. My, my yes. Point. So when you are talking about the the control, how how do you see the this could be measured, or how 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 the the educators or the school could take a, an advantage in terms of controlling which apps the students installed, or do you have some ideas or key points? Yeah, this is actually very, very uh, diff. Uh, this is actually a very, very difficult question because uh, uh, children have to. Uh, children need privacy too, but we are exposing them to places and to apps, devices that have almost none control. Like my sister now has a WhatsApp. So, so yeah, who, who are she talking to? And in student in a school, it's even more difficult because you'll have like hundreds, thousands of students uh, connecting every time and sending pictures, sending messages, uh, sharing their discoveries of the world. And yeah, I. <laughs> I, I don't know how to do it. It's difficult. It bugs my mind because at the same time, you want them to develop themselves. Uh, we have like the infinitude of the internet right in their pockets at all day. So, yes. <laughs> yes, it's, very, it's always a very difficult question. <laughs> about the, the control or law enforcement when, when you think about this. So I am pointing to, to Eric. Eric, you have uh, five minutes for this question. Okay, thank you. So um, um, I'll, I'll start with this phrase that IT is not security, uh, uh, meaning IT department is not the cybersecurity department. So um, 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 one thing that, that that's especially school management a lot of school management should do is they should invest in cybersecurity. The same way they are investing in IT equipment, the IT gadgets, the IT department, having IT department in, on, in, the, in the school premises, they should also invest in cybersecurity. Because right now, um, um, IT department, what I, what, what I normally see is IT department would, 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 would fix, would, um, uh, fix the systems, put the systems in place. Cybersecurity is there to do assurance, to make sure that these things are in safe hands. These things are safe when it's on the internet. So schools that are owning their own data centers, that are having their own network, their own servers, should probably have a SOC in their environment. Because who watches over your, your network on the internet? Because I'm exposing everything on the internet. Who is watching over them? IT will not be able to watch over them because they are the people who implemented it. And the person who implements something are not the same people who should watch over them because they would even go, they will, they will not even look or overlook their flaws. So schools should also start start investing into socks, start invest, investing into IDS, that's in the intuition detection systems, and IPS, start investing into SIMS to, to, to watch over their network. Because this is where most of the attacks come from. Uh, uh, my colleague uh, 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 from Nigeria made mention of ransomware attacks to institutions. And all, the, all of these attacks comes from or emanates from the um, data centers 
B not even works. Even applications doesn't even have security locks that are that that, that they are they are they are that or a place where security locks are being are being put into or are being put uh, 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 there for for people to do analysis and all that. Schools get defaced and 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 the next thing you you, you hear is um, um, they have cleared, they have wiped the server and then they have restored an old backup. Have you thought about how the compromise happened? You just clear it. It's going to happen again. But if we have systems in place, we have a cyber security unit in place, even apps that schools develop, in-house apps that they develop, would, for, would, 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 would be subjected to a pen test before it even goes online. And all of this helps. And, 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 and so, so these are some of the things that, that I think should be put in place. Now, when it comes to uh, um, 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 students or the youth, being involved in, 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 in policy making. Um, I would see that, yes, a lot of um, um, even these students are even engaging or are even, even learning more when it comes to cyber security because right now cyber security has become um, 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 something for the youth or something for the younger ones. Yes, the older generations will be there, but the youth are, are even doing more sophisticated um, 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 things when it comes to the internet. The, the younger ones, I, I, I have a, a, a kid sister, like, like the first kid. I, I, I have a kid sister who, who certain things that, 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 that she's able to do on the internet sometimes amazes me. I ask, I, you know, who taught you this? I, I, I read it online. I, I saw it on a YouTube channel. So I read this online. I have asked. As, as young young people, as um, 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 DHS graduates um, and SSS graduates, who are even writing Python scripts to 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 get um, um, passwords from 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 uh, public Wi-Fi. So these are these are the things that 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 some of the youth are even engaging in. These are some of the knowledge or the knowledge they are even acquiring. Now, what are we doing with these kids? What are we doing with the knowledge they are acquiring? If we have a, even a forum um, 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 where they can even bring their, their, their contributions on board, they can even bring their contributions as to how to solve some of these challenges, some of these problems. It will amaze you some of the inputs these kids are going to, or the, the younger ones like us, are going to even bring on board that would help solve a lot of uh, 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 situations and a lot of issues. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. You also touched very interesting points, like the, the because these cybersecurity incidents, I think, at schools could can lead uh, for really bad trouble for students, staff, and schools also. And the youth are aware of that, and as you say, they could also help uh, in terms of or at least criticize like the infrastructure and and. and they are also using white hats and black hats, so they, they could help uh, with, with the things. So now I, I'm going to listen to Samaila. You have five minutes also to, to raise your, your points on, on this matter. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, I appreciate the, the things Eric said, um, and I think it, we have a similar situation in, in Nigeria to what he experiences in Ghana. Um, so uh, regarding the remaining challenges, um, I think, as we all know, in the, in the tech industry, anything, any gadget or any uh, tool that is about three, five years old is almost obsolete. So meaning that this tech space is very fast paced. And so because of these innovations, a lot of people get left behind. For instance, we talked about the issue of digital literacy, how a lot of people had to migrate their students um, to online for learning. But we have a lot of schools that couldn't even do that. They don't have the, the computers, they don't have the networks. So a lot of students were left behind. A lot of students stopped learning during the pandemic. So we see that there are, there are, there are, different, um, there are different paces or different communities. And so that's, uh, that's a big issue, that's a big challenge um, for me. And this ties to the issue of, um, of, of finances as well. A lot of countries or schools do not have the finance it takes or the, or the money it's, that, that's required to buy this infrastructure and to, to even hire the IT unit, talk less of a security unit <laughs> um, um, as well. Uh, and yes, the infrastructure deficits. In some countries, the cost of one gigabyte of data is way higher than in some other countries. So, 
So this, this kind of disparity in different locations um, pose different challenges. Um, and when we talk about guaranteeing um, online privacy, I think it's, it's kind of impossible because the only way to guarantee online privacy and online security is to make the internet 100% safe. And as we know, there's nothing like 100% security. There, there are always going to be um, issues and threats. And sometimes these threats could be internal. So it could be coming from your own students, not necessarily um, outsiders trying to attack you. It could be coming from parents of the students. Maybe a parent could take a picture of their kid, and, and the picture has maybe a school badge showing. And so maybe someone who wants to kidnap that parent's kid now knows the school of, this, of, the, of, uh, of the child. So sometimes the risks are from within. So, so these are issues to, to consider, and it makes it more difficult to guarantee um, on the privacy and the security of, of online learners. Um, but like I said in my, previous, in my previous statement, one key thing to do, one thing we cannot stop doing is, um, is, is enlightenment, cybersecurity awareness. We must keep enlightening people because the threats are changing. We're talking about phishing attacks. The phishing, um, like the context in the phishing emails keep changing. It's not the same email that is being sent around the world. They keep modifying, they keep improving, they keep adding, now they're adding ransomware to it. There are drive-by downloads as well, and other uh, schemes are being used. Adware is also merged with, uh, with, um, with, with phishing and other things. So as, as, as these um, schemes keep changing, we need to keep enlightening the users, enlightening the teachers, enlightening ourselves with the security professionals as well. That will help. Now, on the angle of youth being involved in policy making, I think uh, it's important to be part of a community. Uh, maybe in your school you join, uh, you have a security community or a policy community you join. Even outside the school, you could join an association or a society, and uh, uh, um, and you could try to attend events like um, like IGF, for instance. I, I believe IGF gives gives us a good platform to discuss these issues and to discuss the the things we th uh, think would take us forward in this regard. And, and, and the simple reason why it's important for you to be involved, because the internet belongs to us in the sense that we are the ones who are, who are alive or, or, or growing up in the, in the tech revolution, if I may use that um, phrase. So if we do not get involved, um, who is going to do it for us? Who is going to take us to the next level so our kids can come and enjoy a safer internet? So I think um, the youth have a key role to play. And um, we can do this by at attending for our, like, um, like IGF or joining a community or organizing our own local events in our communities for us to discuss these issues and see how we can influence policy making um, uh, on the larger scale in our countries. Thank you. Thank you, Samaila. Yes, uh, I, I agree with you about the, the innovation uh, introducing new digital uh, gaps, right, and disparities, because there are a lot of disparities among the different countries. Um, well, the, the resources thing is, is one of the most uh, important thing also because uh, the, this could lead to, to these more vulnerabilities, right? If it's not attended. And these new, these new threats like the, the adwords, phishing, so the issue of the youth to be more enlightened uh, and uh, attending or being involved in more security meetings, I think is something uh, very important also. And I think it's already happening. We, we have seen a lot of youth being uh, more involved in, in these security symposiums or meetings in the IETF also. So very nice. And I will move to Nidhi. So Nidhi, the floor is yours. You have five minutes. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, so I think that my colleagues have addressed the issue of cybersecurity quite well. Eric has talked about it. Samela has talked about it. There have been increased instances of DDoS attacks, and that's definitely something that needs to be considered. But in my five minutes, I would like to, I think, focus on the challenges to privacy that you have. Um, there are, of course, a lot of challenges to privacy that arise from this uh, sort of shift to online education. And it is virtually impossible to make the internet 100% safe. But I think one of the ones that I would like to focus on is probably notice and consent. Um, so one of the most vital elements that you have while you are protecting the privacy is the informed consent of an individual. Um, and that means, of course, informed consent means that needs to be qualified consent. So it can't just be that somebody takes, oh, I agree with terms and conditions, and you assume that you have the consent of the person. Um, there are a lot of challenges, I think, specifically in terms of ed tech that comes with taking the consent of people. One of which was just highlighted 
by both Nicholas and Samaila, and that is things like socioeconomic divide. If you do not have the option of using something else, then you would, of course, have to use whatever is given to you. That is one of the problems. You do not have the sort of uh, resources to afford something else. So you are sort of stuck accepting uh, whatever is given to you, whatever device is given to you or whatever platform is given to you. Uh, another thing is, of course, that the digital literacy may be low, so you are not entirely certain of what is happening, um, so you accept the terms and conditions. Even when there are uh, some kinds of uh, sort of, say, legal protections in place, a lot of the times that just means that people say that instead of the children giving consent, you need to take consent from the parents. The parents themselves may not know how the data is being used, so that's still not qualified consent. So I think that before people sort of embark on this, it is important to some extent to explain to people what exactly happens when they give this data online so that they can at least make the decision for themselves. There will obviously have to be some changes that take place in order for this to happen. The other aspect of this would be this. Uh, that is to say that uh, the people collecting the data should be more transparent and more accountable for the sort of data that they're collecting uh, from children, from schools, uh, and transparently make available uh, like the sort of ways they're benefiting from it. Uh, and that is also so that you can protect the personal data of students. So you need to be able to ensure that corporations are not using this data in any sort of an adverse manner or in a way that could affect them adversely later. Um, speaking of then, I think uh, how the youth can be more involved. Um, I know both my colleagues have already talked about this, but being part of multi-stakeholder processes like the youth sig, uh, like the youth sig, or joining uh, like say organizations that do work around this um, youth observatory, for example, speaking at things like the IGF, they are good starting steps. Um, another way I think that the youth can sort of participate is that uh, you could build a network from other, uh, like with other people from around the world. So you can have slightly more diverse perspectives um, and have like a slightly more diverse view on what is happening. So you have a more, say, wholesome plan of how to deal with this. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. I think you, you touched on more interesting topics like form of consent, resources, again, and well, the the issue of cooperation is not using the data, some kind of diverse perspectives between all stakeholders also. So, Savio, I am pointing to you. You have five or six minutes to respond to this one. Thank you for one extra minute again. So, <laughs> uh, before starting, two side comments. When we talk about security, we also have to talk about reliability. So, I'm not using more that timing. I'm using my smartphone to this, but so, and the second side co side comment is that I was not going to touch this point, but please, uh, oh, but thank you, Eric, for saying that the people who are managing systems that can't have decisions about security because we are trying to make the things work and security make the fingers the things make maybe sometimes hard to work. So thank you for pointing this out, uh, but. Uh, I think that uh, all the other speakers had, had pointed some important things uh, uh, out. So uh, I have now, uh, you put me in, in a trouble to point something out, but I have one, one, one issue for you too. So this is actually a call to, to, to action uh, to work, uh, to use the youth community to get in touch with the uh, students collectives like the, the, the uh, in high school the students units the uh, in the university to to talk about them about the need for security the need for 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 privacy and to to give them some material for asking uh, in the institute in institutions uh, for the cybersecurity policies. I think that this is the main point. There are many and many documents talking about that. Not maybe not exactly ab uh, about the cybersecurity in, in the education, but most part of the the, the cybersecurity issues. Not only cybersecurity issues, but uh, actually security uh, in the general time, li like for for 
uh, firefighters, for f uh, airplanes, and f for many things. The, the principles are, are the same, and this is the base for everything. S but uh, speci specifically from, from the cybersecurity point of view, I think that uh, us, as the youth com community, uh, we can take those documents and each one in, in, in his own country, uh, reach out these this, uh, academic communities, the collective that have uh, uh, that represent the voice of the the students in the uh, university and the school, high school and primary school. So we can reach them, talk them, talk with them about that, uh, and make some force to have good cybersecurity policies at any school or university. So this this idea of the capacity building and and for the academia and, and also trying to to represent the youth uh, in the these spaces also is always very important. But well, we, we know that school networks are easy target for cyber crime criminals, right? What schools can do to show up the defenses to limit uh, uh, the damage, really? That uh, is my question now, so uh, uh, you are free to, to, to speak. Joao, if you want. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so thank you. Uh, one, uh, one, ex one experience that I can share is about our uh, my university. Uh, in Brazil, we have a federation of, uh, of public universities. So there are a bunch of systems that are integrated between these universities, and this approach could be a good solution to the cybersecurity lack uh, the lack of cyber specific cybersecurity teams in schools because uh, cybersecurity needs um, maintenance. And maintenance is it's it has a high cost actually. So when we talk about securing securing the websites, the networks from these schools. A good approach could be uh, formating uh, and create uh, some school, use these schools federations to try to implement a same system with a coordinated uh, cyber uh, cyber security approach. Um, I, I I would like to remember too that users, me included. Uh, will always choose the simplest approach to make a system work. This is not uh, this is not a problem actually, but the way to deal with this and make uh, insecure uh, insecure I don't know uh, insecure methods and uh, use of technology to make this secure. You need awareness. So you, if you know that there is a problem of sending uh, sensitive data of the students from a public channel or something like that, if you understand the problem, you will be able to do the... Uh, you will choose to do the right way. So I think it's also a matter of bringing awareness and showing that this, the security uh, issues are not like something to bother you, to bother. It's actually something that you need to do because you need to protect yourself. And this kind of uh, mentality change, uh, it's really needed when we are talking about cybersecurity. So when talking about cybersecurity in schools, it's even more important because people are learning there. Uh, yes, that's it. Thank you. Uh, do the, the speakers want to raise uh, more points about this issue? So, yeah, no. yes, Eric, go ahead. Okay, 
So uh, um, what, what I would what like to add to is um, this, this, that this is something that, that, that I am doing, I'm trying to even encourage in Ghana here. Um, I, I, what, what I'm doing now is I'm forming a lot of cybersecurity clubs in the investors. Because now looking at uh, 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 cybersecurity here in Ghana, especially, uh, most of the youth wants to now engage themselves in ethical hacking, in, in, in hacking, in hacking. And I look at it in this perspective that if you, if you leave them to learn on their own, it will be difficult for you to um, uh, uh, guide them or it will be difficult for you to uh, be able to, uh, uh, what, what word should I use? To be able to uh, then govern them when it comes to issues uh, pertaining to ethical hacking, pertaining to hacking and stuff, because most of them will not even know or, or will not even have the idea what what the consequences are in in let's say scanning someone's network. So um, I, um, um, this this is one thing that that, that 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 I'm doing that I'm also encouraging that uh, um, others can also start doing especially those of us who are in the, in the in the professional field that we form clubs in in most of these in universities because yes those are the places where 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 the students now start to learn and, and certain culture certain behaviors so if you form these clubs in the universities you end up now teaching these kids the right way and then even adding the the, the side effect or or, or what 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 uh, the consequences in doing some of these acts what it it, it brings it it, 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 it it can bring to to them and then also now if somebody or if these young ones sees you as let's say their mentor somebody who is teaching them somebody who is educating them creating awareness for them you would be able to um, 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 and guide them and then even tell them what to do and what not to, to, to do. When you speak, they will listen. As to someone who learned on his own and then doing his stuff, and then you trying to come and tell him that, no, we don't do it this way, we don't do this. Don't attack the system, don't attack this, don't do this. They will not even mind you because they learned their thing on their own. But the place where they see you to be somebody who is offering them free tuition on some of these things, they start calling you their mentor, they start regarding you as their mentor. You'll be able to, 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 to care of them and then nature them and then even push them, them from, from, from even those who want to even move into, let's say, like black hats or something. Move them into 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 the the, the, the enterprise world or, 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 or yes the enterprise world so that their skills can be beneficial instead of they using it to do other thing else. So so this is also another another um, um, submission I would like to to to, to add, add add on. Thank you, Eric. I think also that the the mentors part. Uh, doing this awareness uh, for the youth that are trying to do some ethical hacking or something, I think it's very nice because they, they need to be, or they will need, uh, they will feel that like, like they are in some manner protected by, by the school. So there are some uh, things that, that, that could, could be done in that sense, I think. So I don't know if the, any of the speakers was to raise on another point. Uh, yeah, I think just one more thing that I would add is that uh, potentially what could be done is that when, of course, we've missed the ball on that a little bit, but you can still do that, is just to introduce small classes or workshops while you're conducting online schools uh, where teachers can just at least discuss the basics of cyber hygiene. Um, a lot of the students have been told that their classes move online, but they haven't really been taught how the online system works. So I think one of the simpler ways to sort of start out would to just have teachers in school who can tell children what this means, especially for the younger children, so that they are aware of what the dangers online are. Um, so I think that would be like one of the smaller steps that people could start with. Excellent. I think this, this idea, you raise a very interesting idea to, to bring some workshops to, to the schools and um, do talk about uh, cyber hygiene. I think as as we as we receive it sometimes well at least in my school when I was a, a child I received uh, 
some groups of people talking about environmental things, or we received some things talking about you need to, to brush your teeth so for the IGN. So the, this idea of, of doing some workshops about, well, the online education, uh, cyber security uh, things are, are very good for, for the students to be aware of what are the dangers, what are, because if not, they, they will be in the context uh, of, of all these vulnerabilities happen and, and maybe they, they didn't know about that. So I think it's a, it's a good approach. Uh, I have here Samaila that wants to make also some comments, so Samaila. Yeah, so I, I strongly agree with um, Erica Nidi, and it's important to guide the students, it's important to, sh to show them um, what is right and how to do it. Um, something that's also, uh, or rather a good way of um, helping them remember these cyber hygiene tips is um, if, um, if it's a school that has access to email, their email accounts and things like that, you could be sending them maybe monthly newsletters, short. You have to make it short because um, like kids have little attention span. <laughs> so you have to simplify it. You make it simple language and you make it short. Just it's, uh, maybe a tip a week or a tip a month so you don't also spam them. Another way is you can have posters in your classrooms. Or remember to lock your screen when you're using your laptop. You're about to put a passcode on your... So just basic tips you can just put on the walls in the classrooms around the school. It helps to remind people. I've seen organizations that do this, where they do it so that their employees remember this basic security steps. So it's, this can also be implemented um, in the schools. Um, um, during my undergraduate studies, um, we had a course called ITC 101. And it was basically a course on Microsoft Office. It was compulsory for all students, regardless of your, of your, of your program. So it, uh, if schools recognize that cyber security is an essential service, and it's not just a service you use while you're in the school, it's something that you use at home, you use maybe when you graduate in your work environment, just the same way we use Microsoft Office today in our <laughs> work environment. Um, it's, it's, it's more or less like a life skill you learn. It's a survival skill. So if schools see it from this angle, then um, they could also organize a s simple course, maybe, a, maybe one credit hour course or three credit hour course that students could learn Compulsorily, it must do it once before you graduate. That way, you are prepared for both your life at school, life at home, and life after school. Wow, very interesting points also. So now we are going uh, for our third part of the meeting that will be some uh, discussion. So we invite all online attendees and on-site attendees, uh, one and one, if you want to, to go to a microphone and make some questions. Do we have some hands on the Zoom? Oh, we have one question here, so you can go to, to the mic here at the conference. Please state your name and organization, as always. Ufebi, from Friends of Communications, Abuja, Nigeria. Um, my first point is, isn't there a way of Put in something like a filter in the school system so that um, the contents are monitored. That's my first question. Second one is um, the man that spoke from, I um, can't remember his name now, from West Africa. He spoke about putting in place um, SOC. And um, he spoke something again about IDS. I want him to tell us more about the IDS. I know about SOC, I know about SAS also. Thank you. Nice. So who wants to address this one? Shoao, OK. I wanted you to go, because you're a pen tester. <laughs> but yeah, because he's talking about um, filtering, IP filtering um, for websites. So I think you can just explain that briefly. OK. Uh, actually, I am a pen tester, too. But <laughs> let's go. Um, the main issue about this kind of filter is that uh, most of the sites, thankfully, now uses uh, encryption. And some cell phones in the, the, uh, uh, the, mo the economic mode for data uses a VPN, uh, some sort of treatment in the data before the, this is sent, so this diminishes a lot of how to control this kind of content, like 
but yeah, I agree with you. We could do some approaches to it, but actually I think they must be ineffective because children, okay, they are going to connect to the school internet, but if the school internet blocks Facebook and the kid want to open it, it will just like switch to the mobile network and and again they will return to this st unattended state. So yeah, I think if we do control it in the network, the school network, it will be better than do nothing. But I think that in a lot of cases, this actually won't uh, won't do the effectiveness that we wanted to. Uh, another thing is that these uh, the this approach must be done with the families too, because the, the families must understand that they need to check the cell phone to understand what their kids are from, to, to what their kids are doing in their cell phone. Yes, because uh, if you implement the right uh, the right boundaries in the devices, you will diminish a lot the risk and the exposure of these kids and actually their data too. Thank you, Joao. I oh. think, Samaila, you have something to add to this? Uh, yes, yeah, so like, um, like Joao rightly said, you can't always monitor them because they could go to their mobile data if you block, if you use some web filtering. Uh, um, measures on the on the school network. Um, what is important is um, is about um, the kids having principles or having um, a knowledge of what is right and wrong. So at, at the level of the parents, if the children are being taught well, if they are groomed well, then they know better than to do certain things. At the end of the day, even we adults in the work environment, we are unpredictable. Even where there are security policies. We do not follow them. Even we, the security guys, don't follow all the security policies that we, we advocate for. So at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's an, it's, the main thing is for the, if, if the children know what is right and what is wrong, they are less likely to do the wrong thing. And even if they do the wrong thing, they know that what they've done the wrong thing. So they might not do it as, as frequently as, as, as one would expect. So I think parents have a huge role to play because um, they cannot just leave the kids without enlightening them. And that's why the parents need to be enlightened themselves, because if they do not know, how can they teach? Right, so I think um, this is an issue for parents to get involved in. The children must be able to trust you to share their experiences with you and let you know what they are doing so they don't have to hide and go behind your back to do certain things. And then I think the issue on IDS, Eric, Eric, do you want to, do you want to comment on, on IDS issue to just briefly explain what it is? Okay, sure. Sure. So um, IDS, IDS is, is, is like the full name I said earlier, is Intuition Detection System. Um, 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 these are, are, are um, tools or devices or software applications that monitor network uh, um, or a system for malicious activities. Uh, we have a lot of ideas, um, 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 like example, I'll give is CrowdStrike. So um, um, what, what, what this does is it, it monitors activities, it monitors um, your network, it monitors whatever you are doing on the network. If you should install, let's say, CrowdStrike on, on your endpoint users and, 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 and desktops or laptops or, or machines, um, you are going to have, uh, let's say, an overview or an eye over every system that is in your network far and near. So if you have a network of, of let's say, a, 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 a whole community and you, are, you have, uh, let's say, an, an, an IDS, in place for the whole community. You'll be able to sit at, at, at one, one point, maybe at your data center or at your SOC uh, and, 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 and monitoring, and then have an overview of, of everything that is going on uh, and what was done, what was even if, if, if a file was copied from, from a system, if, if there is something that is going on, somebody has opened an, 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 a website that, 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 that is not supposed to be open, a malicious website or what, what have you. So, so this is what uh, uh, an IDS seems to achieve. 
So if I mention IBS, so it, it just it's a, it's, a, it's a detection system that detects um, 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 uh, network activities, that detects mal malicious or non-malicious activities, anything at all that is going on on the, on the ne ne network. So it's like you having an eye over your network environment anywhere you are. I don't know if, if, I've, if I've explained it much, much, much clearer for, for, for him. Thank you. Very nice. So we have a question that is very related to what, to what we talked. So I, I will just read it, and maybe you, you can address as we have some extra minutes. Uh, Frank de Almeida said, for me, as an educator, the main issue is the control of the content. The research takes you for some content not usable for children. Uh, should enterprise like Google monitorize, uh, uh, could monitorize effectively their contents? How should they do that? Yes, you, you have a question? Oh, OK, go to the mic, yes. And every person in the Zoom also, if you want to raise your hands, you can also uh, participate uh, orally. OK, go good ahead. morning, everybody. This is uh, Omar Shoran for the record uh, from the Libyan Internet Society. Uh, okay, I'd, I'd like to add some words to the colleagues, uh, you know, uh, uh, notes about the uh, usage of internet uh, for kids. All right, you know, we are living in a digital era, and you cannot prevent your kids from using the, um, you know, the technology. Um, uh, using the technology for the kids is, is a sword with two edges, you know, so they have positive and negative, you know, effects. My my question to the speakers is: um, Is it um, is is it the right time to to um, you know to encourage the industry to make uh, you know uh, intervention in this in this effort? I mean, uh, unicorn companies like Google, um, you know, YouTube and, uh, and Facebook and etc. So I believe this is. This is the right time to encourage them to to make their part, to make their homework regarding, you know, uh, uh, because uh, awareness campaigns and uh, using, you know, the traditional policy uh, for cybersecurity in schools and in, you know, primary schools and in education would not be enough to prevent, you know, this uh, 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 this issue. I believe, you know, encouraging the the industry to put their efforts. Uh, together with the community to prevent these cybersecurity issues, uh, I believe so. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And okay, <laughs> Shoao, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think most of the companies went to the easiest approach possible, that which was like, oh, don't we. We know that there are children using our system, but they shouldn't. So we will not do anything because they are circumventing our, they are not on, uh, they are not valid users. Like, oh, they lied in the, the entrance and inserted fake data. But so when we find these children, we will just uh, kick them out. But this is a, this isn't a practical solution. I myself, I think I created an Orkut like a thousand years uh, before my rated age. And yes, the, these companies need to know that the, their products are being used and need to prepare themselves to that. In that sense, uh, Google actually already does uh, control uh, content in their devices. I configured a, a, a cell phone for my sister. It was a little bit painful and took a lot of time, but I could manage to, to select what apps she was going to use. I was able to choose what what were the websites that would that should be blocked or w which one of them were exceptions to to her but yeah this was 
<laughs> this was a great effort <laughs> to do it. So maybe it should be more simple, I think, because uh, we know that everybody will use these systems and we must be prepare prepared to that. Excellent. Uh, I think that uh, as we are like eight minutes uh, for the end of the session, uh, I could read more one one question that we have here in the in the chat, and then we we go for the final remarks, uh, which uh, of the speakers could pick. So uh, I have a question here from Eileen. She said, "Hi everyone. Not sure this was mentioned before, but I really like the concept of the educational flyers for students to be aware of the dangers and best practices for the cybersecurity practices. Do you have any suggestion at which age it could be done?" When do you consider children, for instance, could be fully aware on secure internet usage? Thank you. So, who wants to address this one? Um, I could address the question. First. Okay, Nidhi, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think Eileen's actually uh, touched upon a topic which is one of the biggest problems that people have right now in regulating, um, especially legally regulating children online, is that there is no real age uh, that demarcates anymore, uh, especially for children online. So universally, the age is still accepted at 18, but depending upon the country, sometimes like the US can only really has like the, the legal protections up to the age of 13, some states have it to 16, and some states have it to 18. Um, I do not think that it is really possible to have one age where you can say now that, okay, above this age, all the children are completely cognizant of their actions online because this depends on a lot of things. It depends on like the country you're from, uh, the culture you've grown up in, how much access you had to technology, even your socioeconomic background. Uh, if you've had free access to the internet for a long time, you'll probably a lot more used to how it works. And if you hadn't, even if you've not had a lot of access to say in the internet and you're 17 years old, you still wouldn't have a lot of idea. Um, so I think that contextually, probably this is something that you can't really have alone. Um, but better, I think, in terms of say, if it's just introducing the education, it might be better to start this earlier. Because now you have like younger and younger children going online. So it's probably better to start this towards, say, elementary school instead of waiting for high school or the people to on 18. Um, yeah. Thank you. So, Samaya, do, do you want to comment? So, 30 yeah. seconds comment? Yes, I will, I will merge it with my, with, with my closing remarks. So, I must say that um, cybersecurity is looked at from the angle of the people, the process, and technology. So, even as you're enlightening the people and checking their behavior, you must also have processes through your policy that people know they, and to take, and there must be technological interventions. That's why we talk about security measures and controls, right? And I think when, when working on the uh, awareness posters or emails or content generally, um, you have to customize it based on your demographic. What you would put for five-year-olds or six-year-olds won't be the same content you use for 15-year-olds because their knowledge um, or, the, or their ability to grasp is different. Um, I th and I think the, the, the big tech names, like, uh, like Omar mentioned earlier, I think they're doing some, some things. For instance, we have Netflix, Netflix Kids. Um, we have screen time on, on iOS devices and, and things like that. So um, I think some effort has been made. Generally speaking, cybersecurity must be treated as an essential component of any system. It must not be seen as an afterthought. It must not be treated as an option because we are in digital space and we need cybersecurity in digital space. Thank you. Wow, well, very interesting points. You said you want to address something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that this point actually must must start uh, at the same time as our mom says, don't talk to strangers, to strangers by the streets or look at the both sides of the street when you, when you are crossing. So this is not security in a, another planet like the internet is in our lives. So uh, it has it has to be the same progression. Uh, of knowledge and awareness as we learn how to care about our all own life. So it, this is not, uh, I mean, not that direct to the point, but it, it's maybe a reference to working policies for creating a curricula or something like that. 
for kids in these schools. Nice, Be very good remarks on that. So now I will uh, rapidly uh, shift to, to the closing remarks. So I will start with Joao. One minute per speaker. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank you all for being here. This debate about uh, cybersecurity in education is essential because the minds are there. We need to form people that are able to understand technology and know what are the risks and things that they should or shouldn't do in the internet, not only like to protect from the outside, but also to prepare the person to this unprotected world that they will be. So yeah, uh, thank you again. Thank you, Joao. Moving to Eric now, Eric. Yes, okay. Um, so my, 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 my closing remarks would be that um, cybersecurity is for it, 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 it's everyone's um, uh, 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 obligation, it's everyone's concern. Like uh, um, Samila said, said, said in, in, in his remarks, uh, closing remarks that uh, uh, cybersecurity is, 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 is comprises of the people, the policies, uh, uh, that is the process, the technologies. So you cannot leave any any of them out. So uh, uh, as we get the technology in place and we get the people creating awareness for the people, we should also follow some 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 policies. We also follow some directions. We should we should adhere to these policies because um, trust me, online education has come to stay. But it's not moving now. Online, online education has come to stay. So we need to adjust. We need to uh, also adjust ourselves to this new kind of new change, and then and then and then conform to it, and then just follow the policy and the, and the direction that, that that has been given. And I think um, uh, 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 everything will, will, will work out nice. Thank you. Yes, I really agree with you that this is a very complex uh, thing to. For how how this the future of this will be is like a really complex matter. I will rapidly read a comment that is on the chat that Angela Nimba said uh, just to add a comment to the discussion. This is an issue that does not have a straightforward solution. The approach should be a multi-layer one, given all complexities. It should be a partnership between parents, schools, and service providers. It takes a village. So we all agree on that. And now I am moving rapidly to Nidi. Uh, for the closing, the, your closing remarks, and then Savio, and we are finished. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, I think I just want to sort of reiterate that everybody has a right to privacy, and this especially includes more vulnerable groups like children. Uh, so it's important that this right is properly educated as they move online, um, especially with so many of them coming online now that education is moved online. Uh, so it's important that we have sort of safeguards in place to protect their privacy and safeguard their data and uh, protect them from adverse uh, sort of actors. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. So, Savio, you are closing the session. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A big thing to care about. But I have just uh, a few things to say, uh, reinforcing what I have said in the starting of the session, uh, if you are in the head of one school or university, please invest in, in capacity building for your team, for your IT and your security team. Give the right roles to the right persons. Separate the IT team, uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, from the security team. Uh, make some investment in creating your, your cybersecurity policy. Uh, and your cybersecurity cyber security culture in the institute, in, in your university or school. And if you are a student, use your voice and ask for security and privacy. Just this. And thank you very much for being present and on site and online. Thank you, everyone. Really, it was a very interesting session.